I'm an associate professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature, and I'm the director of the Digital Humanities, of the Digital Humanities Initiative. Welcome to the Digital Humanities Center. Um, I am thrilled today for this event. Um, we welcome back to campus uh, professors Emeriti, Larry McCaffrey, and Cinda Gregory, who serve the Woo! Department of English and Comparative Literature. <laughs> They left their imprint on this institution and on the legacy of literary history more broadly. And it's actually that legacy um, that we're honoring here today. The Larry McCaffrey Archives just opened in special collections, and these are a treasure trove of the history of postmodern literature and the genre of the literary interview. And I know it's this, this summer, I'm going to be in there, so you'll find me more in those archives. <laughs> Um, in honor of the McCaffrey Archives opening, we get to welcome Mark Danielewski to campus. And I'm thrilled because I'm a fan, like a real fan. Um, my very first scholarly essay was on House of Leaves, and I have written and published on almost all of his novels. And I've taught House of Leaves and the Familiar Volume 1 here at State. And in fact, two of my classes um, are reading it right now, so there's a lot of excited and confused fans who have lots of questions for you. <laughs> um, Larry is, uh, uh, Mark is going to introduce Larry, actually, but before he does, I want to just offer a few thank yous. First, to Special Collections, also to the English Department, Mollus, and the Digital Humanities Initiative for making today possible. And I want to thank especially Amanda Lanthorn. Where is she? Where she go? Oh, there she is. <laughs> responsible for curating the collection, the exhibition, and making the programming possible, so thank you so much, Amanda. Um, and finally, I just want to make a, a kind of scholarly and pedagogical point, um, one of my um, interests these days, which is the event we're having um, showcases how personal relationships and friendships are the stuff of literary history. So friendships um, can foster the production and the reception, as we'll hear today, of literature, and today you're going to see um, how a personal connection and friendship is the stuff of the literary. So, thank you all for being here, and please join me in welcoming Mark Danielewski. turning on the mic we're here all right so I have known Larry and Cinda for nearly 20 years um, I have been to their desert uh, they are welcome at my home I have been to Larry's classes and uh, my wife and I were married three years ago at midnight and ask me questions about that later. But Larry and Cinda were there to uh, raise a glass and share their light. Um, so suffice it to say, I am very biased. Now it's true that I'm, I'm here because of that friendship. But regardless of that friendship, I would be here to celebrate the Larry McCaffrey archive. Because as is true with all good archives, Good archives understand that it's not the narrative itself that matters. 
It's, it's how we engage that narrative. Um, so of course, one of the instincts that we all have when it comes to say a piece by, by Larry, and I'm referring to a very specific piece, which is volume 44 of Critique, uh, Contemporary Studies in American Fiction, uh, that exists in this uh, archive, which contains on page 99 through 135 an interview called Haunted House between myself, Larry, and Cinda. And you can find that in the archive. Now the temptation is that we could just uh, jump online, do some searching, and find that piece. And you probably will. But you must do it with some peril because there are many versions out there and many of them are incomplete. The trouble is also, if you do manage to find the complete version, it will still be divorced from the context of those pages, the dialogues between other books and other authors that are going on, right? So the thing that's so exciting about this, this, this archive is that you can go there and find all the kind of noises and dialogues that were going on around it. Because one of, the, one of the things that's problematic about even looking at just that volume is that it creates a false sense of the complete. Even I was reading, rereading it um, recently, and even I had this experience of completeness. Like, here is what was asked, and here is what I said. But of course, that's not the true story. The true story is, as you can imagine, very complex, and it requires our engagement. It began way back in 2000 when House of Leaves first came out, and I began to hear murmurs of this duo named Larry McCaffrey and Cinda Gregory, and through authorized and unauthorized channels, they wanted to meet. It was a little scary because they lived in a desolate and very dangerous place. Handwritten notes were exchanged. A meeting was finally arranged, and then it was canceled. But finally, in a diner in Hollywood, where I had previously been a plumber, we gathered, and we talked for a long, long time. And that should have been enough. But it turned out that was only take one. More emails, more flurry of this and that. Six months later, the transcribed version of this, of this interview arrived, and Larry and I agreed to do the whole thing over. This time I would drive down to him, which I did, and we would meet and we would talk for a very long time. And Larry, for those of you who don't know him, has this great flair for the mysterious and fun. You know, his last email to me before this meeting was, meet me at the intersection of Highway 86 and S22. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's, it's just breathtaking to me that, that all of this stuff is now located in one place. That you're not only going to see the volume where it was officially published, but you can actually see the transcription of that first take. You can actually hear the, the, the tapes. You can actually visit probably too many emails, you know, describing how we would go back and forth and also just get a sense of how one cultivates a version that can go on to be quite impactful. And, uh, and one of the things that I think was very sobering for me and, and, and even somewhat sad is that as I was preparing for this, I, I returned to my own personal archive and um, I began to dig around for these emails. And, and, and the analog, I have, to, I have to say, is very durable but it's less accessible. And the digital is kind of spooky. Because what time has shown me is how, how, how ghost-making um, time can be on our virtual existence. I mean, even the email addresses that Larry and I shared are, are a cause for pause, you know? Back in those days, I was, either in or out of the loop, uh, via loop.com. And Larry, with his big heart, was always in reach at inreach.com. But those services are long gone. 
While the text of our correspondence is, correspondence is, is preserved, the attachments that promise pages of interesting things or a picture or two come up as zero kilobytes. And all those links to all those sites that promised an even sort of greater understanding to what we were chattering about are broken. Archive is a tricky, tricky thing. You know, if we, if we look just at the word by way of um, Latin and Greek, we come to government, documents, begins to settle a little with to rule, regere, which means to straighten out and order. But perhaps a valuable beneficial pun here would be the word arc. Arc comes down by way of Latin and Greek to chest, to defend, to hold. We know it a number of ways, but probably the most recognized is Noah's Ark. Well, governments repeatedly demonstrate for us in their flailings and failings that it is not enough to just rule. It is not enough to store. Noah understood it a little better. We have to care. Because Noah wasn't just tending the past. He was tending the future. Quite literally, he had to make sure that he kept the future alive. So, in the spirit of a conversation that we started 20 years ago, take one, take two, Larry, Cinda, and I decided that we would do take three. And it is in the spirit of Noah's Ark, perhaps a little more modest, perhaps, <laughs> that I would like to invite up here the amazing Cinda Gregory and the inestimable Larry McCaffrey. Please, let's give them a hand. talking about my shirt. <laughs> uh, those of you that know me, this may be the first time you've seen me in a something other than a Hawaiian shirt, and this is a shirt from Norway. And I spent the last two years immersed in Norway. We took a two-month trip up there. So the point is, uh, professors like fiction have got to evolve. Uh, and this leads me to the interview that we did with Mark Danielewski, and I, I don't know why I'm standing up here, but uh, maybe I'll, uh, yeah. Um, I went to school in the 60s. I started graduate school in 1968, two months after I uh, demonstrated on the streets of Chicago. I came out of, I'd say, a revolutionary, you know, the 60s. I, I'm, not, I'm not a 60s guy, not a hippie, but I, I what, what, what I believed was that literature was the most important art form and that fiction provided the most significant way that we have of, of gaining an understanding, uh, a modeling, a representation of, of what the world is. And that that's very important. And it's of ongoing importance. Now, if you want to flash forward 40 years, uh, this is after my career was over. I'd done four books of interviews, I'd finished a fifth book, but Sid and I had dropped out, more or less, to move to the desert and become mystics. <laughs> so, a couple of years into this, though, we did our last interview. And uh, what was it about Mark Danielewski's House of Leaves that, uh, that made, made us come out of retirement? So, I think one way to approach this, oh, thank you. Let me just read the opening of our interview, the introduction, because in the first paragraph, I think you'll see what it was. There was a lot of things, but this, this, this introduction. Remember all those dire premillennial pronouncements about the alarming marginalization of reading and writing in our increasingly visually oriented, digitalized internet era? 
or the claims that the ascendancy of visual media, most notably cinema, but also television, video, and photography, had eclipsed the novel as our culture's preeminent means of providing the means of modeling and interpreting contemporary experience. Or the related insistence that the internet, hypertext, and other new forms of electronic writing capable of combining text, sound, and image had already made old-fashioned print books with their cumbersome physicality increasingly unlikely to survive at all within the global village's electronic system of communications with its bewildering proliferation of lingo's databases in 57 channels. That's an allusion to Bruce Springsteen. Everything I've ever published since 1978 has had at least one reference to Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> in the following interview, Mark Danieleski dismisses such concerns with an almost audacious sense of casual self-assuredness that might seem arrogant were Danieleski not the author of House of Leaves, a stunning mind and genre expanding work which is not only arguably the most impressive literary debut since Thomas Pynchon's V nearly 40 years ago, but which certainly renders any such commentary about the irrelevance and obsolescence of the novel instantly irrelevant and obsolete. Like Melville's Moby Dick, Joyce's Ulysses, and Nabokov's Pale Fire decide only the most obvious comparisons, House of Leaves is a grandly ambitious multi-layered work that simply knocks your socks off with its vast scope, erudition, formal inventiveness, and sheer storytelling skills, while also opening up whole new areas of the novel as an art form. And I'm, I'm going to stop right there because that last part was the most important. That what it, it, it suggested that the, the novel wasn't dead, that there was a that, that there's something there was new possibilities there. Now I'm now going to turn it over to Senate to, to conclude from our introduction. Oops, there. Oops. All right, don't strangle me. <laughs> <laughs> It seems to us that House of Leaves is likely to have a major impact on the current generation of American authors. Among its other accomplishments, it offers a model for those writers struggling to find a means to use the novel to produce a convincing sense of our age's exponential increase in sensory input. This blizzard of white noise, data, random codes, competing narratives has made it difficult to locate where one is in the world, much less to try to create meaningful art about it. At any rate, we would like to conclude this introduction by saying to readers who may feel that the claims we've made for the House of Leaves are hyperbolic, read this novel with skepticism about these claims. Read it for the insights into the alienating effects of art and narcissism into the nature of the unknown or, unrepresent, or unrepresentable or for the poignancy and brutality of its depiction of the deforming power that parents have over their children. Read it to see where the novel has been and where it is heading. Read it to scare yourself silly, but read it. Well, here we are 20 years later, and it's kind of a funny coincidence in lots of ways. Mark, you are now at the age that Larry and I were when we interviewed you. Wow. <laughs> Time flies. You seem really old. Is what <laughs> that means I must seem really, yeah. really old. Uh, and there are also some other coincidences. Our son, Mark, uh, is also the exact age of Mark. Um, and he, he too is a father, and that's something I wanted, I was going to ask uh, Mark about. Uh, when Larry and I had our son, well I was only nine, and Larry was 11 when we had our son. Uh, and we were probably the least, or I was at least, the least self-conscious mother that ever was. I have no idea how I didn't end up killing that kid or doing something. <laughs> But he turned out okay. He turned out okay. But it changed. It changes you. And one of the things I'm curious about, Mark, is how has fatherhood changed you? Well, first thing everyone should know is that I have a nine-month-old, and with that ter territory comes a lot of sleep deprivation. <laughs> sleep de deprivation to the point that you really don't know what's going on. You have blackout moments, 
And so I would just like everyone to know that right now is a blackout. <laughs> <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I want more, Martin, because you are one of the most self-conscious people I've ever met in my life. So how does someone as acutely self-conscious of you as you are, how do you naturally raise a child? <laughs> so a little story first um, it was right about the time that I had done this interview uh, with Larry and Cinda and I just I loved meeting them but I loathed the experience and, and frankly I still kind of uneasy about talking about my work I feel like you know what the work I put all this all these years into the work like let it let it speak for for itself but I suppose being a parent has made me realize that there, that one has to speak for one's progeny a little, you know, enough to sort of safeguard that 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 those moments, I suppose, to to protect those moments, but at the same time not not interfere too much. Um, but when we did that interview, it was I was definitely extremely resistant, and. Um, about that time, I was in New York City, and I was invited to have dinner with Susan Sontag. And this, this was a big deal for me. I mean, I, this was, I was starstruck. And I figured we'd meet at a restaurant, but no, she wanted to meet me at her home. And she lived in a, uh, in a penthouse, and she gave me very you know specific directions. I arrived well into dark, and I remember taking the elevator up to the penthouse. And the elevator door opened, and I sort of peered to the right down the hallway. And I heard a voice to my left say, isn't it funny? Everyone always looks to the right first. <laughs> it must be because we read from left to right. And I said, well, better for you, because my, my jugular is exposed. <laughs> she goes, oh, so defensive. <laughs> So she led me into her amazing apartment with all this artwork and stacks of books and papers everywhere and great windows looking out onto the darkness of New York that sometimes inhabits New York. And um, we went to the kitchen where she had a small wooden table and she got out a, a bottle of peppered vodka and she found that she couldn't open it, so would I, you know? And I said, gladly, because you know, I don't want you to bludgeon me with this bottle. And she said, so defensive. And so we sat down and we were, you know, we drank this, this shot of vodka together and uh, she started talking about House of Leaves and what it was and, um, and she said, I basically think it's a puzzle book. And I was like, well, clearly you haven't read it. And she said, so defensive. <laughs> <laughs> and then the time had come for us to go out to dinner to, to go to a restaurant and I helped her sort of put the vodka back. And I was washing, washing the, the shot glasses in the sink. And I looked up, and there on the walls beside the sink were these old prints of French forts that showed fields of fire and where to shoot from and where not to stand. And I said, you know, for someone who's been calling me defensive all night, I'm not the one with forts on the wall. And she put her hand on my back, and she said, that's very good. <laughs> but I realized, you know, how how right she was, you know, and and how apprehensive I was back then. And I think there's been a process of letting go of all of that. And I think one of the things that, that being a parent accelerates is that you realize there's no real place for defending yourself anymore. That it's beside the point. That what matters is sort of the defenses you extend beyond yourself towards someone who's who's really incapable yet of even engaging the world, and um, and that's a pretty magical experience. Well, uh, more coincidences. Uh, there was a there's a specific passage in House of Leaves from that's a quotation from Susan Sontag's book on photography. Uh, it's something to the effect that uh, people think that photographs make you closer to people, but actually photographs alienate you from people. Uh, and Susan Sontag was, without a doubt, the single most important influence on me when I was in graduate school, 
and undergraduate for that matter. So if you haven't read Susan Sondheim, and one of the very first essay I wrote was an essay about one of her novels, Death Kit, but her criticism was absolutely mind-blowing, and it opened me up to, uh, most importantly of all, her, her essays about film. I can still remember an uh, essay about persona, about Bergman's persona. Anyway, I've got other anecdotes about Sontag, but we've got to move on here. Um, in the original version of the interview, the first take, uh, we were driving up there. I think this is this is actually in the the uh, un the, the lightly edited version of the first interview. Uh, the, the the question I had there was I mentioned a sin as we were driving up here. I was looking through interviews, everything I could come up with, and I I found an interview. Uh, uh, somebody had asked you about the novel, how House of Leaves had evolved, and you said that its real origins had to do with the time you stubbed your toe. But this was one of those topics that Mark refused to talk about. And yes, he was a little defensive, but I respected that. That is, if you're ever going to do interviews, don't ask the writer what something means. Please, don't do that. That's an insult, really. Uh, anyway, we weren't able to get Mark to say anything other than, and by the way, if you look up in the index in House of Leaves, yes, uh, toe is there. But so, Mark, wh what about the toe? Well, I was be I was very defensive at that point. I think it's uh, I'm sort of astounded by what a good answer it is. I, I almost don't want to say more. Um, the I, you know what I, I, I'll I, I'll say this because it's been discussed I think a great deal on the forums or. You know, that there is this element of sort of the language of the body that moves throughout House of Leaves and, you know, whether it's the gut or, in particular, the toe. And, you know, one of the things that it establishes, at least within sort of the, the system that is House of Leaves, is that first letters could be very important in creating words, right? So, you know, I think, I think it, it, it's, it's kind of fun to sort of parse what I was actually thinking because I was being very flippant at that point. I was being very defensive. But at the same time, I think, I think the real awakening for me in House of Leaves was an understanding of how we can comprehend the world. And it was, the, it was a real first moment. I mean, it took 10 years to come to of understanding that that apprehension is almost impossible. So, uh, you know, a simple, like, like a word like toe has been aligned, I won't authorize it, but with the theory of everything. Right? And so if one were to stub one's toe on the theory of everything, it's basically to step away from that idea that what you're, the struggle to kind of, to kind of encapsulate everything is, is a tremendous vanity. And I think, speaking more seriously to the book, I think what made, made the book possible was kind of an experience again and again with, with a, a kind of humiliation kind of a kind of um, failure of strength, a kind of a kind of um, collapse that went on and on as at each time sort of I attempted to arrange it in a way that would kind of reflect the world. And what was strange, and it kind of links back to parenthood, is that and authors, and even even if you're writing papers, you'll understand what this means, what it ultimately collapses into are the characters themselves so that you let go of yourself, you let go of your ego, of your sense of what matters, and suddenly it becomes, who really is Johnny? Who is Pelfino? Who is Zampano? You know? And it's suddenly their universe that matters the most. And suddenly you don't need a theory of everything. You just need an understanding and a compassion for those characters who will bring to life this tiny moment that you are spending all of your time to Incarnate and and let let go of. So do. I was going to see if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to the reader. I remember one of the things that struck me so uh, strongly about when we in our first interviews and in our first conversations was I'd never met a writer who seemed as concerned and as respectful of the reader as as you are and. Uh, I know through these years that you've worked closely on the internet, you've got forums, you've got all of these people that you're constantly getting interaction with, 
And it's so different from the idea of the author that is in this closed room that never goes anywhere. So has your relation, do you still feel as strongly about, do you still consider the reader as much as you did when you be, began writing? Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, it's kind of what I said a little in the introduction of just how important the, the dialogues of other authors, other books, um, other readers, um, uh, just how important that, that conversation is. And um, I mean, I'm certainly lucky, everyone in this room is lucky. Like we live in a time where that, 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 that conversation can be more easily facilitated. I mean, I was, House of Leaves sort of came online as, as the internet was coming online. There's a wonderful little bit in the New York Times right now that shows kind of like the, the dark map of the world starting to glow as the years move from, you know, what was it, 1988 all the way to the present. And so you could sort of see at that time when, when the writing started, it was pretty much dark and then it was slowly, slowly coming to light. But so suddenly there was a way to kind of uh, have that conversation with, uh, with readers. Um, but one of the things, you know, a, a common question that I get is, I think every author gets is, where do you get your inspiration? And you know, it's, it's the wrong question. You don't have to look for inspiration, it's everywhere. The problem is, is how do you, how do you, how do you filter out your inspiration? Because if you are gonna to respond to all the in, in, inspiration that is present right now, we would all be fried like a fuse. There is so much going on. So it's really a question of how do you filter that moment? And one of the things that other readers help is as they kind of begin to wrestle as well with the subjects that, that matter to you, they help sort of focus it. So it's not, you don't ultimately get distracted into a, you know, a trillion different pieces and places and just melt your circuit boards, but that you can kind of begin to kind of, you know, fire together down um, a, a specific path. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's it, it's kind of a wonderful way to kind of, to keep that alive. But I think one of the things that is important, as much as I was just talking about the internet, is it's also important to, to cultivate those conversations that are offline, because there's also, there's also a different way of kind of experiencing those books. And so even today, as we're gathered, even though this is gonna be streamed and whatnot, it's like there is an opportunity as we're here together to have a conversation, especially at the end of this, that is going to be just slightly richer. There's gonna be more bandwidth than anything that might have been fired off on, on Twitter or a comment on Instagram. And so um, let's get there. So I'm gonna sort of follow up on this. Um, in both the earlier version of the interview, we talked quite a lot about this whole issue of the reader. Uh, and a couple of things struck me when, again, from the very first time, is that Mark had such confidence uh, in the reader. I mean, imagine, who's going to read House of Leaves? How do you pitch that? How, how given, given the, where we were in 2000, uh, what was the likelihood that a commercial publisher was going to publish a book like this? And Mark had, he talked quite a lot about, oh, they're not, they're not going to have any problem because they've grown up parallel processing and so forth and so on. But there was something else that, that he mentioned that maybe is specifically, more specifically about House of Leaves. You know, as you read House of Leaves, you, if you, if you get in, into it enough and you need to go through it at least twice or three times, uh, you begin to realize that you've got a character like Johnny assembling the Zampano manuscript, and I'm sorry for mispronouncing that, Mark. I think Fellini would have said, can I just say something? That's, this, is a, this is a classic Mark moment. So, somewhere in the interview, uh, I, I'm saying... Yes, that, you're in the presence of someone who has classic Mark moments. <laughs> yeah, well, this was a classic Mark moment. So, uh, we're, we're fiddling around, we're looking for something, and I, as an aside, say, hey, by the way, how do you say Zampano's name? And Mark sort of laughs, he says, well, an American would uh, say it like, just like you did, Zampano. Uh, and then Cinda says, but what about an, somebody from Italy? And Mark said, Fellini, sure of hell, would have pronounced it Zampano. Am I saying it right? Zampano. Zampano. All right, that's all he said. So several months later, 
My friend Raymond Fetterman says, uh, who was very jealous about Mark's work, Mark said, uh, Raymond, I was talking about the book, and mentioned this is Zampano, and he said, oh, that's the character in Ostrata. That was the character Anthony Quinn played. So it's like, whoa, I, I hadn't thought of that. I didn't realize that was the reference. And then I watched the movie a bunch of times, and then I went off in a months-long thing about Zampano. But Mark didn't mention it, though. All he said was Zampano, what Fellini, sure of hell, would have said. So that really impressed me about Mark. Okay, that's an aside. Mark, okay, let's go back to the, the question about the reader. I just love the image of, like, Larry going on a Fellini bender. <laughs> we call it binge now, Mark. Uh, oh, so no, a bender is something very different from a binge. <laughs> Uh, so, to go back to what I was saying about Johnny Truant, if you're reading this book carefully, you're, you realize that Johnny is projecting himself in his own past onto this manuscript that he's assembling, okay? So, that, 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 that idea works out in all kinds of ways in the book, but with Mark, when we did the interview, he, he referred to the invitational nature of A House of Leaves. And the idea was, and I think this is really important, it's one of the reasons so many people from so many different vocations, truck drivers, whatever, respond to this book. You said something to the effect, Mark, that you wanted to create a book that uh, invited the readers to project themselves into the manuscript rather than just identifying with the readers on a kind of intellectual. So that, that seems very important. Well, I think it's, it's again, it's sort of, a, I, I guess that's something that really hasn't shifted over the years. It's like, like I was saying again about the importance of a, of a great archive, is it, is it how it encourages, is it encourages us to encounter the narrative, you know? And so I think, you know, I think what I've always said, and I guess it's what I continue to do, is create works that are all about really having a collaborative experience with the reader. It's not about making my point. It's my point isn't the thing that matters. It's, it's the dialogue that goes on between the reader or the artist or the author or, or any number of sort of, you know, variations of, you know, talented individuals who sort of come into, you know, the orbit of these books. And, um, you know, one of the things that troubled me about House of Leaves was, was it's, in, in some ways, it's, it's easier a read simply because it's, all its sort of semiotics are contained. All its systems kind of constantly point you inward. And I've said this before, it's a very sort of centripetal novel. Every, everything you need is for the most part in the book. You can go outside of it, but it's gonna grant you the tools that you need. And it worried me early on to see sort of a kind of obsession, you know, uh, of sort of holding on to this text. And, and one thing that probably everyone in this room recognizes that I have a, you know, I have a, great deal of, of um, skepticism when it comes to sacred texts. I don't even, actually, I, no, not even skepticism, I don't even believe in them, but I do, I do understand that within a social context we can hold on to things that we deem as, as sacred, those starting points. And so future works were, were, became more interested in moving outside of the book, being centrifugal. I mean, Only Revolutions is the most difficult book to read, it's the most difficult book to write, but it's definitely centrifugal. Your answers are outside of the book. You're, the reader is constantly like driven, all puns intended, off the page into the world. And um, so, I, that's, that's enough of an answer. <laughs> Uh, you say in the in the uh, our interview, you you emphasize how important poetry is, and I think you said something like poetry is the is the most important art form, or something along those lines. Uh, and I would, and all of your books seem they have an element of, I mean, of, of poems in them. And I was wondering, do you do you see what is your, the connection between the two for you? What is the connection? Uh, I, I, well, I still stand by it. I, I love poems, and I, I feel like it's it's kind of the very this very center of the furnace of language. It's, 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 where, it's where you're working on it, sort of the most quantum level. And that's sort of the, that's an area that I feel constantly aged with. 
I mean, to lay it bare, I think these small kind of perturbations in text are important to the meaning of the overall experience, right? So different fonts make a difference. A different color makes a difference, you know? These are these tiny little oscillations that you're experiencing on the page, but they have a cumulative effect that is quite real and significant. So great poets work with that constantly, even their placement of words on the page, right? Even their, their understanding of the roots of language, the context of, of, of various words and how shifting context creates new meanings. They also understand that what is purported to be said is not what's said, you know, as much as, as much as one could isolate the subject of a book like House of Leaves or the familiar, whichever one you want to pick, it's, it's really more about the experience that the reader is having with those texts. How is she or he engaging in that? And how, how is there a place for them within, you know, that, that world that you're, you're creating and what, and what does it offer? And so, you know, I'm constantly returning, you know, to poetry as a way to kind of, you know, humble me, I suppose, you know, and just, you know, I mean, I was revisiting all of Bolaño's poems recently, and there was a, a similar kind of, you know, interest in keeping alive, you know, the language, the music, the fluidity of, of all of that. You know. I'm kind of curious. I know that when you were... We have a mic grab. <laughs> <laughs> We struggle often over the mic, uh, but I remember as a as a young man, and you were in Europe, that uh, sometimes when you would strike up conversations with people, uh, they might offer to buy you a meal, or and in return you would write them a poem. And I, has anybody ever contacted you about those poems? Oh, poems. oh this is this is so cool. Uh, so yeah, I was kind of where. Where, I mean, one of, what, I, what I had been saying earlier about how ultimately as you kind of let go of your theories of everything and begin to sort of focus on the characters um, was very important. And, and I guess one of the things that you could sort of see in House of Leaves is like, well, okay, but this is all Mark, but not necessarily. And, and so there was one thing that was important to me. I actually put myself specifically in House of Leaves. There's a small little cameo. And it wasn't so much to do the Alfred Hitchcock, which is what I was thinking of at the time, but it was a way of saying, no, you're not that character, and you're not that character, and you're not that character. You're over there just, you know, wearing some glasses, you know? And so by allowing the specificity, specificity of my placement there, it kind of freed up a place for everyone else. Um, but one of the areas that kind of overlapped with Johnny were a series of, of poems called the Pelican Poems, and it's what Cinda was talking about. And I basically always said, hey, look, I'd scribble something, you know, on a train in Europe or wherever, a train station where I was sleeping, and I was like, yeah, they get me a coffee or something, and it was really cool. I said, someday it's going to be in a book. And, uh, and, you know, eventually the Pelican Poems were put in a book. But this, just at the end of last year via Facebook, I got a message with a picture of one of the Pelican poems that was written, and they still had it. But here, here was the astonishing thing. It kind of brings us back to the archives. It was one of the poems that wasn't included, and it suddenly jarred in my mind, like, wait a minute, there's a ton of these poems, you know? So who knows, maybe I'll do the extended version of the Pelican poem someday. <laughs> So remember, when some guy in a train gives you a poem or a story, <laughs> run the other it. way. <laughs> Mark, uh, we, we probably should at least briefly talk about film and your work. Your, your father's film, Spain Open Door, uh, was one that was never seen but only described. Again, this is all, I, I recommend looking at the interview, the critique interview that explains this. Uh, in some ways, that film was the most, or, or film, but that film was the most obvious influence on House of Leaves. The missing film, the film that may never have existed. Over the years, you've talked uh, quite a lot about how your father influenced your understanding of the mechanisms of film. Has any of this changed? Does, have you changed your relationship to film or way to manufacture your own work? So, 
It was uh, sort of the early 70s. My, uh, my father, we'd, we'd, we'd been moving around quite a bit and we ended up going to Spain and my father filmed a documentary. Uh, it included uh, Salvador Dali, uh, Segovia. I think it had actually footage with Franco. And, um, and then the film was taken. And my father used to, to speak, you know, in this sort of, you know, in, you know, just in this melancholy way that his film had been lost, right? So it was one of those things that I actually hadn't been as aware of until sort of, I guess, midway or later in, in House of Leaves that, you know, that of course my childhood was steeped in stories about a film that didn't exist. So apparently the film does exist. I was recently contacted by two guys who were living in Madrid and they had overheard me giving an interview and responding in a similar way as I, as I just did in, you know, over the Spanish airways. And they had decided that they were gonna find the film. So Spain Open Door exists. Now, I don't know what form it's in. I don't know if it's the cut that my father would have approved. I don't know if it's been manipulated for propaganda to you know, frame the way Franco was. And there's no way to look at it and show my father and say, is this what you intended to bring up all the thorny issues that, that surround intentionality? The other little quirk right now is that the filmmakers basically are not allowing me to see the film unless I participate in their film. So at this point, I'm really not keen on doing reality television or something, so I, I may never get to see the film, but it's, it's out there and, you know, who knows. And I think one of the things it, it, it brings up is this, is that I have spoken at length over the years about, you know, how my father would discuss film in a, in a very sort of, sort of specific, almost grammatical way about how a scene was shot and how it was framed and what the politics of color or angles are, et cetera, et cetera. And often it's been with this backdrop of missing films, of films that he didn't make. Um, but I, ha I have had an experience, and I was thinking about this, especially as I was reviewing everything that Larry and I had discussed over the years, which is that, of course, my father did leave some films behind, right? And it, it, it made me realize that my experience with film wasn't purely intellectual. And so there was a little film that we made called How to Make Daddy Fly. Now, it culminated with a scene of my father jumping up on, up and down on top of a bed with a white rat in the middle. Now, don't ask me how that fits into anything. It doesn't fit into this story. But what preceded it was sort of this interesting little, little thing, and I realized that my father, one summer, was teaching me how to make a film. He bought like a little hand crank, crank editing bay, you know, with a little like, a little screen, a little light, and, he, and, a, and a little splicer that used scotch tape. And we went to my grandparents' place, which was outside of Philadelphia. And I remember one day he, he like put me and my sister in a red toy wagon. And he had my mom sort of dragging the, the wagon. And then he ran into frame and he dragged it. And so he had the tripod. And I was like, I don't understand this, you know? And then the, the next day, he had a picture of my grandmother sort of throwing us out of the house. So it was already out of sequence, right? And then there was a dog that I was terrified of that was lived nearby. It was a German shepherd. Um, his name was Rommel. And so my, my dad like flagged down the woman who owned Rommel and he said, yeah, can you just get your dog to sit and we'll put the camera here and you call Rommel and Rommel will come running towards the, the camera, right? And so I was like terrified, clinging to tripod and dad. Dog just ran by, didn't you know care about me. And I had no idea what was going on. And then I think I forgot about it. And then a month later, the film was developed. Dad brought it in and he began to cut it all together. And so here was the family getting thrown out of the house. And then suddenly the big dog was chasing us, and then you'd cut to the to the kids and the mom and dad pulling the pulling the red wagon, and you'd cut to the dog, and you know, wow, that's how films were made. So I had this kind of tactile, tangible experience with film, right? Now that's a pretty boring story, really, and I hope I've been able to animate it somewhat. <laughs> but it gets better. I'm going to tell you a ghost story, and it's a real ghost story. 
So some years ago, I get a call. There's a guy who knew my dad in the war. I was like, oh, he'd been in the camp with my dad. I was like, oh. And he lived in Palo Alto. And I won't tell you his name because I don't know if he wants to be known. But I, one rainy morning, I, I left LA and I drove up to interview this guy. So it turns out that my dad, who was about 18 when the war started in Poland, when the Germans invaded, had fallen in love with this older woman who had two kids, whose husband had basically been taken away, I think. We don't know what happened to him. Um, and they were together throughout the war. It was my father at 18, this older woman, and these two kids. And they were in Warsaw during the Warsaw Insurrection. If you've seen The Pianist, you know what, what that city finally looked out. It looked like 200,000 dead, the thing leveled. And they were captured, and they were put on a train. And this is where it gets, we're not sure of any of this. All these stories kind of vibrate, it's sort of a whatever, quantum foam. But they were supposedly heading for a death camp. May have, it may well have been Auschwitz. It was likely it was Dachau. And then one late night, um, as the train was on, apparently this woman, savior that she was, managed to bargain with some jewelry that she'd hidden the, with one of, the, uh, one of the guards, and they escaped into the countryside. But now they're in a hostile country, and they have nowhere to hide, right? So they have to figure out a way to get captured that doesn't send them to a death camp. And they managed to get put in a camp that was close to the border. And it was there that my father, you know, survived with these three other people. And they lived on turnips. My father would occasionally point to pictures of like, you know, you know, survivors who weighed like 90 pounds. He said, maybe that's me. You know, he's constantly kind of looking for himself. And word started to spread that the Americans were making, were getting closer and closer. And the fear was that the Nazis were going to execute everyone in the camp. And so my father and this woman said, we've got to escape. We've got to get out. Now, because it wasn't a death camp, they sort of had some lax rules about, like, you could plant a garden. Part of it was that it kept them alive. They could plant turnips and whatnot just outside. So they began to make these preparations and compromise the fence and you know whatever the details are. And then they decided the night had come. So are you with me? Are you leaping a little ahead? They snuck under the fence, they grabbed the two kids, and they made it to the edge of the forest. Because of course the big problem was how are we going to get away far enough? We can't carry the kids all the way. And they had found a little toy red wagon. Wow. And they put the kids in the wagon. And they took it as far as they could, which ended up being a small little town and they hit that was deserted. And they hid in the basement. And in the morning, they heard thunder. And they were terrified because they'd never heard anything that loud. And my father crept up and the woman crept up and they looked out and the American tanks were rolling through. And by the time they got out, they were, they were on the Allied side of the lines. Good storyteller. <laughs> uh, Mark, I, I, I probably, I don't know about the audience, but uh, if, if anybody's looked at the interview, but probably the most surprising moment in the interview is I have a long involved question about the impact of computers and multimedia hypertext on on writing and blah, 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 and that obviously this is somebody, and Mark says, uh, aha, and he says, be sure to put that in all caps. I finally get to say this. I didn't create House of Leaves on a word processor. I created it with a pencil. So, very interesting. So I'm wondering, do you still use a pencil as, as, you're, as you're writing? So, and he, he goes on and talks, quite a bit about how, how, what a big advantage a pencil is over a word processor for all of you would-be writers. 
But Mark, has that has that still changed? Do you still find the flexibility of the? Yeah, absolutely. That hasn't changed. I think that was just uh, an early lesson. I think it, it 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 harkens to my father again in the sense that it was you know it, he was a man who had actually been caged, enslaved, and he just never wanted to be put in any cage. It was like his commitment to sort of finding freedom was you know to the end, and um, and I think one of the things he always he, he always told us was was you know, don't let, don't let, don't let technology cage you. Don't become the puppet of what technology is giving you and offering you, but actually, you know, create with the most powerful, imaginative machine there is on the planet, which is your mind, and then find and tailor the technology to suit what you're doing. And it still is that way. I still, I, I have a, a, maybe a broader range of pencils. They're colored pencils, you know. But I love to start first with a sketchbook and kind of, kind of a, even, the, even the most recent piece that I did in the Gagosian Quarterly is um, called Love is Not a Flame. And it's a, it's a grand tale about a peacock that falls in love with a raccoon. And so there's this huge peacock, but that peacock, even though it's made out of words that are, you know, significant for this this small story, are was originated with just a hand drawn kind of version of that of that um, peacock. And then it was it was a matter of figuring out how to use the right technology to make that happen. I mean, even when I was doing House of Leeds, I mean, only revolutions. I mean, now in in InDesign, you can actually rotate the whole spread, but you couldn't do that. So I would literally, I had literally built a contraption that would enable me to turn the monitor upside down, so I could work on the opposing narratives. <coughs> well, yeah. I just want to mention that we're going to have class probably leaving at three fifteen, so I want to. Make oh. sure that we have lots okay, of so uh, last question then, and we'll turn it over so I can get my. So one of the great moments in the interview, I don't remember if it was first or second take, whatever, but uh, I asked Mark if anybody had ever come up with an interpretation of House of Leaves or any aspect of House of Leaves that he hadn't already anticipated. Yeah, I so I believe this was in the original interview, and Mark says no, uh, not yet. Uh, but I, but I hope so. So later on, when we did the second interview, I took a shot at this. And if you're interested, it has to do with one of the pages in uh, Pelafina's The Mothers. And it's the Forgive Me page, where she's saying, forgive me, and it's all done. So anyway, I won't go. I, so I said to Mark, you know, so that page there, uh, what is that? Uh, the mother didn't write that. She couldn't possibly, or she didn't, she might have written a letter, but it didn't look anything like that. So, so there, so have you ever thought of that? And so Mark just said, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, somebody else has intervened. So that, that was the end of that question. But today, I have one more here, and I, I need a, it's a visual aid. So we're, we're trying to stump Mark. So another thing with Mark, he seemed to remember everything, every little thing. You know, misspelled word. It's not a misspelled word, by the way. Uh, so Mark, so don't look, Mark. Give me a second. Here. <laughs> don't step on the glass yet. Hold on. Oh, 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 sorry. I am not looking. Okay, don't look. So unfortunately, the head of this guy is missing. Can I look? Okay, so Mark. <laughs> so I want everybody to see. This was a bobblehead. Uh, well, I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you later, but it was Pee Wee Reese uh, pushing Roy Campanella, whose head is. So, Mark, can you can you can you identify this object? I've never seen it before in my life. <laughs> See, I, I don't. I don't. Well, it's very possible. I'm lying. It's yeah. true. Yeah. What Larry wants me to talk about is how there are two characters that are very important at the heart of the familiar, and they may or may not have something to do with these two wonderful folk here. And that particular little artifact with a head was described in the familiar, and. Uh, Yes, Larry does have a literary existence or a fictional <laughs> existence. Immortalized. But I thought it was so funny. It, it's one of the scariest moments in volume three. Oh. Uh, it's where the recluse reveals to Bobby and Cass 
that uh, he tells them he's somewhere, but then gradually they, they, they see that he's actually in their place, the, the place that they've had to abandon, their original home. And as he describes the room, it's our trailer in the hands of Marengo. <laughs> right on down to, and, and the recluse, this really scary moment, he picks up, sort of like, what the hell is this? <laughs> uh, what's this kitschy? Uh, so, but I, I figured he would probably remember that, but. Remember, I am still in a blackout. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think now is a good time. Yeah, let's not forget the students. I yeah, see a clock yeah. that says 3.07, right. and if they so, have to leave by 3.15, right. it's right. our job to be bro, enticing bro. enough that they want to be late for class. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yes. So, uh, since House of Leaves came out, there was uh, talk around that time of you not doing any type of uh, movie or TV show with it. Now there are rumors that a movie is possible. Just wanted to hear your take on that. Yes, good question. Can I run out the clock? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say things are presently undecided, but they are moving forward in a possible direction to maybe do something if if, if, if all met. Um, but I will say this, it was, it was as I finished, um, as I had finished, well, actually volume five was about to come out. I had finished volume six and there was kind of a coalescing conversation with my publisher about putting the series on pause. We basically needed more readers and um, I'm still, wishful, optimistic that those readers exist. Uh, I think once people uh, get past you know, volume two, once they really get into it, it moves very quickly. I've yet to meet anyone who just stopped in the middle of volume three. Like it's then once you're in it, you figured it out, you've internalized its dynamics, you have a great reading experience. And I think, I think we've, we've seen that sort of play out. And so I would very much like to continue. But I also realized that if I were to trust my fate to the metrics that Facebook provides or Twitter provides, I will die an agonizing death. <laughs> so I have to move outside of those bubbles and sort of contemplate other ways. But I was um, in, in Manila uh, for a literary conference and, uh, and it was at that moment that it was pretty clear that we were gonna pause the series um, for a little while, and at that moment, a big streaming company sort of re reached out and was like, hey, do you want to make a series out of that? And so that created a whole dialogue. But they were just too greedy, and which was sort of appalling considering how much they had that I ultimately had to walk away from that. And I will say I have to just give a, you know, just a humbling bow before my wife. Imagine that a big company is offering you a lot of money and you're five months pregnant, and you may lose the house, and you may lose everything. And I was turning to my wife, expecting her to say, well, we have to take it, we have no choice. And she looked at me and she said, you know, the deal's a little rapey. <laughs> and that was it, and she meant it. She was like, she was willing to risk a lot. And so we decided to stick it out and say no. But consequently, more people became interested, and I think I think the fact that I was now open to this change and sort of considering a form, especially if it could bring more eyes to the familiar series, um, I had to think in multiple moves and multiple directions, and um, and and I've actually met some really good people along the way. So there's a lot of pieces that still need to be put in place for something like that to happen, but I'm definitely open to it. And uh, given the kind of creative talent that's right now sur uh, uh, surrounding series, um, it would be sort of a privilege to become involved in that process, but there's no guarantee that it's gonna happen. Thank you. Yes. You talked about your, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you talked about your father's experience of the Holocaust. Um, do you think that has in any way affected your work and your worldview? How has my father's experience of the Holocaust affected my work and my worldview? Has it? Yes, of course it has. You know, I mean, um, it, you know, even the word Holocaust is, is, is a complicated word because I don't, I, and, I, and I hope I made this clear, he ultimately was not in a death camp. You know, he, his awareness of, 
of the Holocaust per se was not a front row seat. If anything, it was a back row seat that allowed him to quickly escape the theater of war and you know, be rid of it. But my father never talked about, um, about the war. You know, towards the end when he was, when he was dying, he, he, he shed a little more light. Now and then there were stories. Uh, he never spoke of Poland. He never spoke Polish. Uh, he embraced, you know, the United States entirely. Um, but, you know, we realized that there were all sorts of things that were communicated without being particularly attached to a narrative that we would call a war narrative. And I'll give you one small example that we were in a supermarket, just my father and me. I was, I was young, and um, we were standing in a line. And he recognized that the line was going s slow. And he's like, we, you always have to change lines. Do not get stuck in a slow line. And I'm like, Dad, you have to wait another minute. That doesn't matter, you know? And he's like, no, 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 we gotta go here. And he would look around and he, you know, you, there was a great deal of energy. And of course he would like find one that was moving a little faster. Well, that's a war story. That's like, are you in the wrong line? If you're in the wrong line, you're gonna die. If you stay on the train too long, you're gonna die. Like you're con And so it was these kind of things like where someone else, I mean, probably most of you didn't have parents that would panic of, over what line you were standing in with some, you know, Twinkies. God, I hope he didn't buy Twinkies. I know he didn't buy Twinkies. <laughs> Maybe I want a Twinkie, I don't know. Yes? Um, I actually really enjoyed reading your book. The Nightline channel, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know, like, what are your thoughts of his take on the House of Leaves? Right, so the question was about Nightmind, which is uh, he's a, a fellow, we would say, right, who has a YouTube channel. And um, he, about two weeks ago, or actually nine days ago, um, issued the House of Leaves challenge, and so a lot of people read the book. Um, and I assume, did you complete the challenge? Yes, I well, did. Well done. Five Bravo. Days. Wow, five days. Um, <laughs> took me 10 years to write. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have actually not seen the videos, you know, but I've always been encouraging towards people who want to riff. There's all sorts of ways of kind of encountering House of Leaves, and one way is simply just as a reader, and one and another way is, is someone that's a, you know, I think more seasoned in academia and wants to sort of really lift up the hood and get into it. Um, another is just artists. You know, there's a, a band named Biffy Clyro. They're fantastic. They, they come out of Scotland, and they, they wrote an album uh, called Only Revolutions, which is, you know, their own thing, but it's a riff on what Only Revolutions is about. And I have to tell you, it's one of the great compliments when another artist says, hey, this meant this to me and I'm going to take it to this place. So I think it's too early to tell, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm paying attention. Okay. Yeah. In one of my classes, we're reading the familiar volume one. And I know you don't like questions about what does it mean, <laughs> but we're having endless debate as to what the color pink might signify. Right. And so the question is about what does pink, which uh, um, which appears mostly in the word uh, familiar, what the, what is its significance? And you know, I mean, you're a very brave soul because you know I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you want the reassurance from me that that I won't answer it. So you don't have to worry that I, I will never answer that question. I will never answer why house is blue. Um, but I will say that it is important, right? I mean, these, there, there's actually a very limited color palette that I've used slowly expanding with more recent works because what I've always sought is to create a vocabulary of color so that if you see house and it's not blue, what does that mean? Or if it were a different color? Or when, it, when it's appearing in text where house is all black and it's suddenly blue. Or familiar. You could read House of Leaves, familiar comes up a fair amount. Like, what would it mean if suddenly one of those familiars turned pink? How would that suddenly begin to rewrite parts of House of Leaves? So what is the significance of that, that color? And um, I don't really have, there's not time right now to sort of encapsulate everything that I said in a recent talk in Ohio, but I would encourage you to go to YouTube and look up my presentation called A Colored Word. It kind of talks a little more in detail about the various books and this, the importance, to me at least, of, of those colors.
So thank you for asking the question. I know it didn't quite answer what you okay. wanted, I but <laughs> but it's an important discussion to have. And you know, and when you begin to look at what a colored word means, you know, then you begin to look at at this strange black and white world that doesn't have to be necessary. Like, why are why is text all black and white? Why do we persist in that? You know, one little little anecdote, which is in a colored word, um, this presentation is that I did a a, 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 a preface for um, Gaston Bach Bachelard's book Poetics of Sp Space, and it was black and white, so house was in gray, um, but the cover was colored. Right, so you could just you could do anything you want, and they put my bio.